Hey everybody, welcome to the RSP Film Room, and today's guest is one Charles McDonald, who, as if you um, follow folks on Twitter, you should follow him at 4Verts, F-O-U-R-V-E-R-T-S. Charles, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on again. I, I'm excited to start diving into this draft work again. Yeah, absolutely, and Charles is great. If you have, if you have not follow Charles yet you very much should he and Justice Mosqueda are doing some great work with a new podcast called Setting the Edge um, they just had Ian Rappaport on with the NFL Network and um, I would definitely suggest checking out the work that they do um, at their various outlets as well as what they're doing especially on their podcast um, you're going to find two guys who really know the game and you know I'm hopefully have both of them on on a good on a regular basis as we do these RSP film rooms. Today we're going to look at um, Jaleel Johnson, the defensive lineman from Iowa. And um, I asked each of our guests this time to let me know who they would like to watch. And then I give them a, a short questionnaire of a little bit of homework to do just in advance, which all these guys are doing anyway. So yeah. why not just, you know, give a list of some things that we think that people are going to would need to see to get an idea about who that player is. So that's about, this is about the most I'm going to talk, I think probably for this show. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Thankfully. So I want to, you know, first is just, you know, Charles, if you'll tell everybody why you chose Jaleel Johnson, what it is that you, you find, you know, that you like about him, find intriguing. And then, you know, what we will probably see today as a whole? Uh, well, I, I just, I really like watching defensive linemen for the draft. Like for the podcast, Justice and I set in the edge, like that's kind of our big thing. It's like we love watching the defensive line and the front seven guys. So uh, that's always where I start off when it comes to draft season. And I was just kind of working my way through uh, the senior bowl guys before we went down to Alabama and I was watching Jaleel. And, you know, I, I, the first game I turned on was this game on uh, versus Iowa State on draft breakdown. And I'm, I'm a sucker for guys who, like, really get the process of, of, of uh, like, defensive line play. Because, you know, I feel like every year we fall in love with guys like Robert Kandichi last year, who's, uh, you know, really athletic and has the pedigree as a five-star recruit. But when you watch him play, he, he doesn't really know what he's doing. And when you get to the NFL – Everyone is like all the offensive linemen. They're they're freaks, just like the defensive linemen are. So you're not really going to out athlete people like that. You have to understand the blocking schemes. You have to know where you're supposed to go. You have to use the right technique. And I, I think those are things that Jaleel does really well. And you know he, he's not the twitchiest guy, but he, he's definitely not a bad athlete. And I, I think when you had take a guy who's already got he's got a down pack from the mental aspect of the game and he's already got, he's got some nice physical traits. I think he's going to end up being, uh, I don't know if he's going to go around one because it doesn't seem like buzz on him. Like they did with Sheldon Rankins last year, but I, I think he's going to be a nice value pick and a, a starter for a long time in the NFL. It's funny. Cause when I hear you describe him, I think of, from a skill player standpoint, I would think of a player like Corey Davis. <laughs> I mean, the way you described your little Johnson, I go, that's how I described Corey Davis as a wide receiver. He's not unbelievably twitchy. He's, he, you know, he may not be the top athlete that people are going to drool over, but he knows what he's doing. And he's yeah. at, and he does have some nice athletic skills that, that lend itself to him being a good pro for a long time. So this, this should be a lot of fun. And the way that we're going to break this down is that, I asked Charles to list for me some some must see plays that fit a variety of categories. They're going to be things that come that are either promising about his prospects that are commonly seen on tape, um, or what he needs to work on. In addition to things that maybe things that may be confusing to how someone viewing him for the first time. Um, that might be confusing to judge if you're looking at it or might even have been confusing um, for Charles because when we all watch tape, there are plays that we watch and we go, I don't know if I would look at it from this perspective or the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or things that are just promising or lacking about technique and as well as promising or lacking about athletic ability. So we're going to look at probably somewhere about, you know, 12 to 16 plays. Um, They're going to be ranging from games at Iowa State, Wisconsin, 
and Penn State. And uh, we're going to get started right now. Um, well, what I really liked about this play was when you have a, a, a slant technique as a defensive lineman. So when he's working back from over the center, and ideally he should be trying to get to that B gap. But when you find yourself going against the grain of a blocking scheme like he is right there, it's okay to just kind of sit in that A gap and anchor and redirect so that you can, so you're not over over penetrating or giving a free release to the linebacker uh, on the second level. So I really like that instead of just flowing all the way across the guard's face, he kind of adjusts and stops and sits in that A gap, and that gives him an opportunity to uh, to make that play. And w- when you when you uh, when you look at where he places his hands, this is pretty much perfect hand placement. So he has his uh, his left hand becomes the uh, the man hand on the guard, and that goes straight into his chest, which leaves him room to keep that right arm free just in case the ball carrier decides to declare into that A gap, which he does. So once he keeps his head on, on, on the inside, extends, gets that arm free, and that ball carrier walks right into him. Yeah, and it's kind of a too late proposition for the running back when you think about it because really as he as he takes his ball, you're going to see the position. I mean, we'll look at it from the running back's perspective. He's reading about right here. I mean, he, his best chance is to maybe take one step and try and go out somewhere else, but you're looking at, you know, this is his design crease. You're also looking at that you've got – um, you've got your other defensive tackle outside the shoulder here. So where's he Where's he going to go other than maybe try and cut back and around? And these are things that you're looking at and saying unlikely, you yeah. know, at this yeah. stage. So, and if he's not going to hit this hard, he's pretty much done. And even if he does, he's. Yeah, that was, that was really sound run fits like by the Iowa defense it's all around. Absolutely. All right. So what do we have next here? We're going to look at, all right, 140 with Iowa State. Mm-hmm. All right. Come on back. There we go. I was right there, and I didn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, so Jaleel always lines up on the left side, so there he is again, uh, this time at three tech. And you can kind of see the lower body strength that he has on this play because he just walks that guard right back into the ground. Yeah. And, you know, you always we always talk about when you're going to pass her one arm is longer than two. So when he starts rushing up field and he goes to that one arm to kind of gain separation from the guard, that I mean, for, to go from two arms to one and still have the power to drive and knock a guy over with one arm, and then power your way through the quarterback with no wasted steps—that's really, really impressive. Yeah, and it's and I mean, I like one of the things that I like about this play that you're showing, in addition to the one arm, is just I mean, right away he gets his hands right where they need to be from the jump. Yep. He's he's a he, he's a really aware player. I, I, so when he sees the guard go straight back into the pass set, uh, I mean he, he's not wasting any time trying to rush up the field. And sometimes you see guys, especially near the goal line, you see guys get a little bit hesitant because you know maybe there could be a draw or something. But he 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 he's really good with the play recognition. And as soon as that guard gets into his pass set, he's he's flying up the field. Yeah. And it's a really nice spot. You're right. I mean, the really nice spot for where his hands are, and that does help him get a nice push and being able to one-arm that nice punch. Mm-hmm. And they're kind of – they they he so he starts off uh, like over that A gap, but, you know, the, the, the initial steps he takes kind of gives him a two-way go on that uh, right guard, which forces the center to pick a side. So if this is the center going to go to the other three technique, or is he going to go to Jaleel where Jaleel has kind of made himself a three technique after the play has started and he gets himself in a really good position, stays low when he, as he moves towards that guard and just walks him back into the quarterback, even though he doesn't get the sack here, he still gets enough pressure on the play to uh, cause an incomplete pass. Yeah. 
Let's get it one more time. So uh, what I, I really like is that he forces the center to make a decision right off the bat. Because if he just stayed rushing that A-gap, then you know he's going to walk himself into a double team. But when he takes that step left and kind of makes it, you know, a, a dual three-tech look uh, post-snap, that forces that center to say, okay, well, I can either work back towards this three technique that was already on my side, or I can stay with Jaleel. And you're going to give one of those guys a two-way go, one-on-one -on -one situation. All right, so we got ourselves a second and three. Playing, looks like a little bit inside the guard there, but not much. And, not, you know, you see the hands again immediately. So when, when that guard is a... Uh, I think he's starting on a three technique. Yeah. Yeah. And his first step, his hands are always so good. So he, as soon as he takes that first step and those hands are in the guard's chest and you can see he has such good pad level. His, his helmet's below the guard's helmet. The, his hands and his feet are synchronized. Like when, when you kind of look at how you want to step and strike, I, I always think about it like you're, when I was coaching defensive the line this year, I would say, just think about it like you're a puppet. So when your right, when your right hand moves, your right hand, your right, your right leg needs to follow through with that. So when he's taking that step with his right foot at first, you see that right hand immediately go straight into that chest. Yeah. Bang. And then the left, then the left foot follows. And when you get that pad level like that, it gives you a chance to extend and find the ball carrier. And that's what he does. Relative to other skills with defensive line play, how difficult is it for guys to keep their pads low and to do what you just described? It's difficult because it, it's it's not something that's natural because you you want to stand up and see where the ball care where the ball is, uh, it, but you kind of have to just sit there and trust and say, I can't I can't just stand up and try to find the ball because then I'm putting the linebackers as in harm's way and I'm, I'm leaving my other defensive linemen out to dry. So you just kind of have to trust that everyone else is doing their job. You got to do your job and just kind of sit in the gap that you're supposed to. And that's what he does here. It's kind of like if, if the play is supposed to come to me, it will come to me close right. enough that I'll see it. Then I'll know when to go to it. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Well, good. So those are some things right off the bat that, that really make, you know, those are really good highlights to show in terms of hand usage, pad level, understanding of concepts of how a double team on offense may work and being able to make choices so that you're being patient um, mm -hmm. or putting yourself in position where you get two way goes. And those are, those are great examples you gave. So let's look at some of these must see plays where he may need work. It looks like Penn State is going to be the focal point on this particular yeah, this one. Was not a, this is not a great game for him. Okay. So 446 and 504. All right. Yeah, so this is a double team right here. And, you know, like the, the initial process he goes through is fine because you, when, you, when you hit a double team like this, you really either want to you, – you have two options. You can either sit there and just kind of make a pile and bring down that center and guard with you, or you can try to split it. And I think right here, he's, he kind of seems like he's in a position where he's got the pad level that he can kind of knife through. But I think he gets a little bit decisive when that guard starts to come down on him. And he, he, he's trying to make that pile right there. But, I mean, you can already see that once the way his body's turned, it's too late for that. Yeah. What should he have done? You know, I think in that situation – You've got to just you got to try to blow up the center first, especially in you know a team like Penn State when they're in second and two like this, they're they're giving that ball to Saquon Barkley almost every single time. So I think what you've got to do is just blow up that center and make the angle a little bit harder for the guard to come and get you. But uh, he he just didn't really do that on that play, and he got exposed on the back end. Yeah, he just they lie him down and run right past him. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then five minutes and let's see. Five fifty no, that's five fifty one. Let's see. Five oh four. All right. All right, and this play. Kind of where it's it's the same uh yeah. so so I, I mean, I, I do like that he was able to kind of stay on track 
and find the ball, but you know, you, you just can't be getting pushed three, four yards down the field if you're if you're gonna play that one tech spot. Yeah. So it's kind of like the last play where you know, he needs to be stronger on the center, and you can even see, you know, pad level is good, but you, there's you can be too low, and he's kind of lost his footing right there. I think his knees are almost on the ground like, at the, after the snap of the ball. So, you know, it, it, having good pad level, having low pad, having uh, like lower pads is good, but you still need to be able to, you know, anchor yourself and ha- have a have a sense of balance, and he loses that like right off the bat here. And if someone were to look at this who may not be, you know, knowledgeable about defensive line play, someone might look at this and go, is he strong enough to play this position? Or See, is- I think he is. But what happens is if, if you go back uh, to the, uh, like not, or to the start of the play, okay. when you, remember, so I was talking about how you kind of want your, your hands and feet to be synchronized and stuff like that. When he when the ball snapped, he never brings that right foot back with his right hand. So, yeah, I mean yeah. that kind of leaves him out at, a, at an awkward angle where I mean anyone can just drive him back off the ball, and that's exactly what happens. So it's he, almost, he, he overextends he in a way, no step mm-hmm. at all. Okay. So if you don't step, that means you don't have your base uh, underneath you, and that's I mean these all these guys are too strong. That's that's just gonna that's gonna be a no go. Right, which go, brings back to the point of a guy who is very good in the NFL right now or showed some flash, some very goodness, who talks a lot about leverage, which was one Mike Daniels. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, he talks about being a wrestler and, and understanding leverage and understanding those leverage points, and there's no leverage here. Right. Okay. Just loses immediately. All right. So moving onward, let's take a look at – now we're going to look at some plays that may be confusing to, to folks or may have been confusing to to ourselves here. 140 with Wisconsin. All right. So let's see what makes this play confusing here. We got playing a three. Now, so... What it, now? It, I I don't know if this play is really confusing, but I there's. I don't think a lot of people understand like some of the finer points of defensive line play, so they're running a little twist between the, uh, the defensive end and defensive tackle, and on this play, Jaleel is called the smasher. It is a scraper. So really, what Jaleel's job here is to is to make room for the defensive end to come in and try to get a sack on the quarterback. He knows he's just kind of being a dummy on this play. And what I really like is, you know, even though it's it's illegal, uh, a guard on the – when he crosses that guard's face, I like how he pulls the guard's shoulder uh, towards the sideline so that he can't go reach that guard. So he, he's bringing it on a double team to himself right. so, the defensive lineman can get, so the defensive end can get free for the sack. And, you know, it, it, it's a penalty – in the NFL and in college, but it it rarely gets called. Yeah, it's kind of like the it's kind of like the defensive back and you know playing trail coverage, and then being able to come inside and they've got that back arm on the back of the receiver and giving a little bit of a tug on the jersey. Yeah. You know, if you do it quick enough and and with enough expertise, it's not going to get called. Yeah, and that's it. It's that move right there is a lot harder than it looks, especially coming up the field. When when you're you're running one way and then you kind of have to drag a 300 pound person a few yards so your buddy can get free. That's the timing, strength, and uh, I mean just g- general athletic ability to do that is really really tough. Yeah, because he's kind of using his momentum to make that happen. It's like let me, be able to get the hand on the right yeah. spot as you're coming through, and then be able to have the grip. And pull that point just as so. Yeah, it's almost like getting to uh, like the low post in basketball when you he, he's grabbing that guard and then kind of posting up on the tackle so he, so he, neither of them can get through to the defensive end. Yeah, it's nicely done. Okay, that makes sense. So let's see, two thirteen. Oh, this is one of my favorite plays that he didn't even make. 
So what's going to happen here is they're going to have a, uh, uh, a playboy block, which is you know, a funny term, centerfold. So yeah, centerfold, playboy block. There's the center folding back on the guard, on the defensive tackle. And uh, I, what Jaleel does here is just it, – it's outstanding recognition. Oh wow! So he's 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 not going to make the play uh, just because I mean not many defensive tackles are going to be able to catch a running back like that. But for him to you know realize that he needs to hit that uh, the wrong arm move that quickly was just unbelievable. So when you go back to the start of the play, he's keyed up on the uh, his his key is the guard in front of him. So when that guard goes down i mean ideally you would want to stay in front of the guard so he doesn't have a free release to the linebacker but to kind of replace the guard when he steps down is is pretty good and then when that center is folding back on him and to have the presence of mind to just cut underneath him and hit him with the wrong arm move to get him to keep his chest clean and uh give him like a, a free path into the backfield that's really really good technique yeah look at that just dip yeah. under with the Dip under with that inside pad, that downfield pad. And then, I'm, but I, I like, I really like the process, even if you didn't make the play here. And I think some people might say when they look at this play, oh, well, you know, he didn't, he wasn't near the ball, so I can't really grade it. But no, you can, you can grade how he reacted to what was put in front of him. And based on the keys that he was supposed to read on the play, this is, this is outstanding. No, that makes total sense. And it's, you know, he, he forces this bounce out. Yep. And if that defensive end doesn't get crushed on the edge, that's you have a chance to stop that before he gets to the first down marker. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if this team is playing team ball or was need, everyone was playing what they needed to do, I mean, he made up for he Like you said, he made up for the fact of what was going on up the middle here. So he took away the running backs mm-hmm. first choice. It's well done. I can see how that's that's confusing if if you hadn't known that in terms of how yeah. it works. So let's see, five fifty one. Now this kind of goes back to uh, the the kind of like the earlier Iowa State example when he was on the slant tech and kind of had to stop in his tracks because he was going against the grain of the blocking uh, scheme. So I mean, w- when you look at how run fits work on a defense, where especially in a four man front where there aren't any two gappers, you have so the guard, so the, the tackles have their own gap, then the linebackers have a gap, and the defensive ends have a gap. And what they're doing with, with the four in the middle, so you have Jaleel over the center, the three tech, and then the two backers behind, what they're doing is a gap exchange. And so Jaleel is going to go to the B gap, that three tech is going to go to the A gap, and then the linebackers are going to fill in behind where they're leaving. And if you're not really aware of what, you know, how games and gap exchanges work in the front seven, you could look at this and say, oh, well, Jaleel runs out of place here. Well, no, he didn't run out of place because he's going to that B gap, and then he has that linebacker. I think Josie Jewell behind him is filling in where he left. So if if you're looking at this and you're just saying, "Well, I think Jaleel got pushed out of the A out of out of his gap," well, he that's not what he's supposed to do because he's moving that way, and you see that linebacker filling right behind him. Makes sense. And when you're doing gap exchange like this, what you're trying to do is confuse the the offense. In terms of right. where what they think you're doing, so that mm-hmm. you play right into the defense's hands. Right, and, and I mean it. It seems it seems like complicated from an offensive point of view, but when you look at it from a defensive point of view, you're still covering the same exact gaps. You just have different guys moving, uh, covering the gaps. So you know, it, it, like you said, it, it's more used to confuse the offense. But I think to someone who doesn't really know like X and X and O's, you could get a little bit confused on. Like okay, what what is Jaleel, what is Jaleel doing here? What are the backers doing here? Like what what's kind of going on a little bit? Right now, if you're 
Now, say you're a running back or you're a quarterback in this situation. What do you, you know, what are you, what kind of keys are you looking at here to try and sniff out the fact that this is a gap exchange? Uh, I would first I would look at if you run it back a little bit, okay. like just a second. You you can kind of see. I think that three technique is kind of cheating down a little bit at the start of the play. Yeah, because you can see like he's kind of angled that he's kind of angled in a way where he's he can get to that a gap a little bit easier, and then the, the linebackers are sniffing down a little. They're they're a little bit closer than they usually are, so I, I think kind of alignments that seem a little bit off. Uh, like you know when you're a, a defensive lineman, you're you're taught to look at the knuckles of the offensive lineman to kind of get a hint on if it's going to be a run play or a pass play. So if the, the knuckles are white and he's pressing down real hard, then, you know, it's going to be a run play because he's trying to fire off out of his stance. And you, you can kind of do the same thing from the offensive point of view, where if that guard, if that three tech is kind of tilting in a way that he wasn't tilting before and those linebackers look a little bit antsy, then you, you can kind of get a little bit of a hint that something fishy is going on. Makes sense. Good, good. All right, so moving forward, let's look at some things that – Mr. Jaleel Johnson does in terms of that maybe lacking with technique at this stage. And we're going to go back to Wisconsin, look at the 124 mark here. Here he is over the guard. And then he decides to let the guard go and take on this tackle. Yeah, he gets backdoored here by the tackle, which is not good. And, and th this is something that that does come in, that you do see in his game uh, a, a handful of times, and w especially with so many teams, you know, running like the, those outside zone or like the zone blocking schemes up front, you you've really got to be able to stay in your gaps. And you know, we watched the. I, I know you had to watch the Falcons for football guys. You know, and I'm a big Falcons fan. And what what made their offense so good on those outside zone runs was those like the tackles on the backside were always were almost always getting those reach blocks down. So what Jaleel needs to do here is he needs to get his hands on the guard at first. So if he gets his hands on the guard, uh, that's, that's what that's working away from him. That's going to put him in position to just be right in front of the tackle uh, and not get reached. But he's a little bit late trying to trying to decipher what's going on in front of him. And that lets the tackle get in front. I see. So if he if he gets his hands on the guard, right then, and then that tackle, it, it, it's it's it'd be almost impossible for the tackle to kind of reach reach Jaleel unless he's taking like two or three steps back into the backfield and then working back up the field that way. Yeah, because he's going to get hit in the side, but it's going to be from a standpoint of that if he was fast enough and he's hit in the side on this, he's still able to just run through that and get yeah. into the backfield. And so it's really a it's really about a recognition standpoint, like you said, for this for him at on this play, because you can see he takes even it's a split second thing, but mm -hmm. and even like you, I, I like that he does step with his right foot first, and he, he does try to gain ground on the guard, but he was just a little bit too far away, and I think a little bit slow off the ball. So you, you can even see compared to that defensive tackle. Uh, that's uh, over the center. Yeah, he, he's behind. Uh, you're just a little bit late off the ball, and if you're if you're late off the ball on the outside zone, you're 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 toast. And he gets reached. All right. Looking at let's see, two forty three in Penn State. go got some a gap going on here mm. and yeah you, you can't you, you can't spin versus a run that's just yeah. an absolute no no so so he, he's kind of doing the same thing again versus that uh, the earlier double team 
he's he's not he's not stepping and driving through that center. He he's kind of waiting and catching the he's waiting and catching before he really makes a significant movement. Yeah, so he's kind of passive against double teams. Yeah, I I, I would I would definitely agree with that assessment. He, he's not he, he's not the most stout guy against double teams, but I, I think here he just kind of get he he gets caught when that when that guard comes down and he's just not taking that that big first you know step and strike drive step that he needs to be able to defeat that uh double team yeah no step at all again i mean he lifts his foot up a little bit and then just leans so yeah uh, yeah and when you see things like that i mean does it tell you i mean to me when i see a player do this repeatedly what I see isn't a physical thing. It really is just a mental thing. Like he's just mentally unprepared for this particular situation. Yeah, I, I think I don't think he's a one technique at the next level. Anyways, I, I really like him at a three, but you still got to see where he where he's going to struggle. And I don't know why, but especially versus Penn State, when it came down to these double teams, he was just not really driving off that first off that uh, first step and getting caught in some bad situations. Yeah. All right, so then let's look at him at 6.30. And then here we go again. Yeah. I would say the double team technique is definitely something he really needs to work on. Because even then, like you can see, again, he, he doesn't bring that right foot with him. Yeah. And it's something that on, like, the single blocks he's normally really good at. I don't know I don't know if it's, like, a mental thing where he thinks that he's just got to anchor hard in, on the double teams and he's kind of overthinking a little bit. But, it, I mean, if he brings that foot with him, I, I definitely think from the clips that we saw before where he was tossing off into linemen, I think he's strong enough for the job. I just think... I think I think he might be thinking a little bit too much on the double teams, and when you see a guy that usually plays really fast, like Jaleel does, start to play slow in one certain situation, I think he's kind of overthinking it a little bit. Yeah, it seems like this whole that this whole concept's in his head in a way that in a bad way. Yeah, you know, once the ball snap, you, you can still treat that that first block like you would any other block. You know, just drive through and keep going, yeah. but. Once he once that once he gets that pressure key, the guard kind of coming down on his shoulder. I don't know why it just it, uh, maybe it freaks him out a little bit, but he always stops in these situations. Yeah, he seems frozen. That right off the snap, he seems frozen, like he's anticipating he's going to get hit, as opposed yeah. to him being the one. Like he would, it's almost like getting past that mental block, going look, you know what you're afraid of happening is what you're letting happen. Right. If you just hit the center and drive him back, the any contact you're going to get from the guard is you're not even going to feel it. It's not even going to be, it's not even going to have an impact because you're going to be at a position point where it's not going to matter if right. you even get hit. If you can even get like a, a half a yard of penetration on that center before the guard comes, that's 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 good. Yeah. Because you've you've made that angle harder for the guard, and you can kind of sit, sit down, and the linebackers can eat off of you. And I like I know he's physically capable of doing it, because I mean even at the senior bowl practices in the team drills, I mean he was he, he was manhandling some guys, and I, I think this is just something that that can be coached out of him, and pro, and I think it I think it will be. Yeah, it's funny. I think one of the things that I love about watching film with everybody in the show is there's always, not always, but frequently, there's at least something in a player's game where you have to say to the guy, where the guy needs to hear something to the effect of like, look, physically you can do this, mentally you have some sort of block or just yeah. some obstacle. And it's just always so fascinating to me that so many of these guys have at least one area where there's like a mental obstacle to their game yeah, that they need to overcome. And it's in a way that 
you know, as a fan, you may look at it and go, don't you know who you are? Don't you know what you yeah. can do? Yeah. And, and, and it just shows you that, no, they don't. Not all the time. Not all the time. And like, you see, I'm sure his, his coach has probably gone back to the Iowa State game. Julio, did you see how you just threw that guard? Now, why are you letting this guy push you around like that? And, you know, it's just something that Jaleel probably needs to ask himself and yeah. figure it out from there. All right, so here we go over the center. Yeah, and then a bit, now we're looking at some of the athletic traits. And he doesn't get the sack here, but I really like the acceleration from uh, when he beats the center's block to when the quarterback throws the ball. And, you know, that center, what I – what. I really what I do like about this play is that center is giving him a hard set at first. So when the center is giving you a hard set like that and not just bailing into a pass set, that does have to give you some pause to whether it's going to be a run or pass. But w once he uh, realizes that the center is actually pass blocking, I like that he makes the move to the left, and then you can see that the burst yeah. right there as he closes on the quarterback. Nice. All right, so. Did we look at? I don't think we well, looked at the one twenty four of Wisconsin. I think I skipped that. So let's look, go back to that one. Oh yeah, that was, this was the uh, the where oh. he got reached by the tackle. That's right. That's right. We did do that one. Yeah. I'm. I skipped that thing. Okay, so where we're at is Wisconsin four hundred two. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Got him over the guard. Actually, over yeah, the tackle. Tackle, yeah. And this was a. Uh, this I think that when you, if you if you don't have any like combine numbers to look at, looking at how a, a defensive lineman takes on cut blocks is usually a pretty good, you know, signifier for their athleticism. And like I said, like I said before, Jaleel, he's not the greatest athlete in the world. And I think here, you know, he has pretty solid technique where at first, you know, trying to get trying to get those hands down on the offensive lineman. But usually like the super duper twitchy guys like Aaron Donald and, you know, Sheldon Rankins, like freaks like that, they can uh, like, like push back on that guard and then stay on their feet and, you know, keep going towards the ball carrier. And I, I think that that may be an issue for him in the NFL, or or you do have a little bit of a, a question about his lateral agility in situations like this. I'll probably need to be answered at the combine, but I I, I do think he's not as fluid, you know, going uh, laterally as he is, you know, straightforward. Good example. Very good point. So let's look at it one more time here, and then we will move on. So you want to get your hands on the back like that, but you've got to you've got to stay on your feet as you move laterally down the line of scrimmage. Yeah, and the balance isn't quite there for him to be able to do that at this point. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that comes over. All right. Yeah. I mean, I I do think. I, I think he has really – I think he's explosive. In his, he, may, he may not be, like, the most nimble guy, but I do think he's explosive coming forward. And you're going to see him just absolutely destroy this guard. Yeah. One arm again, and he has him on skates, and then just powers right through for the sack. And once he knows he has a man, he finishes strong. Yeah. That's something we saw even at the beginning of this – of his tape where – He's able to one arm that man, knock him to the side, leap into the air over the defender, and make the um, make the play. Yeah, and I mean this is really crazy strength because I mean he's he's coming back with his left hand, and then you know when he ha when you have a two way go like that, when you're kind of on an island against the guard in space, he you you have a chance to be creative, and I like how he kind of separates himself with his left arm and goes uh, long that way and then comes back underneath with his right for the sack. That's nice. Well done. All right, then 240. I, Go ahead. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if it was 643. I'm pretty sure it's the next play after this. Okay. Where... Uh, 
Yeah, this is it. So now he's on a a, a stunt here, and I mean, look at <laughs> look who he does as that center. I, like I, I think he's when you look at guys who are really explosive coming forward, they usually have really good vertical or broad jumps. So I, I'm expecting him to do well in that area because when he has a, a head of steam, uh, he gets a little space to to kind of build up some speed before he he hits off of the lineman. Bang! Like that that's that's beautiful right there. And then he gets a sack. Well done. Very solid football player who, you know, uses his hands well, mm -hmm. who certainly seems like that he's got the strength, he's got the awareness of how to play a variety of roles within his position in terms of understanding, you know, what the offensive line is trying to do to him and to counter it. It, it seems like that you're you're showing us a player who um you know certainly has closing speed when he's when he smells the blood in the water let's say in terms of the quarterback um and how close it he is and a guy who has the you know the base strength and and base quickness to be able to do the job in the league um it's just a matter of maybe refining for instance if he is going to be used as a one technique, being able to, you know, work off of double teams and understand how to do that and do it with a greater aggressiveness. But we've, as you've shown, he does have the footwork and the hand work to be able to do it. It's just about mentally being prepared and understanding what to do there. Yeah. And like I said, I think he's a great football player. He's not a, a like a, elite game-breaking athlete, but I, I think he does enough things well that he can be an impact player uh, in the NFL. So, I mean, my comparison for him has been uh, Kawan Short for the Carolina Panthers. And w when you look at how the Panthers kind of run their fronts, they they do uh, – they're pretty interchangeable with their guys. So they'll have, you know, Kawan run the one, one play, and Star love to Lely run the three, and or they'll have Kawan run the three and Star run the one. And w when they – they use a lot of movement techniques on their defensive line and kind of like how, how Iowa does. And I, I see a lot of similarities in their game where they're both kind of power rushers that, are gonna, that were productive in college and not the greatest athletes, but really technically sound who are aggressive. Hey, that's great. And you can use players like that. We know that Kawan has played, has been an integral part of that defensive line for the Panthers for, you know, from the jump, really. I mean, he, he seemed to outplay low to Lele, um, as a as a rookie it seemed like early on that he you know he was getting a lot of play early on in you know when he was with the Panthers and Lotulele was the guy everyone was talking about so yeah and another comparison like another way that that comparison works for me is when Kwan was at Purdue he played a ton of snaps and one of the issues was where people were like oh but we don't know if he has an effort problem or if he just dog in it but I mean, when you, when you have someone who's 300 pounds and you put them out there for, you know, 75 to 85 plays a game, you're not going to get 100% on every snap. It's just, it's impossible. And I think what you see in Kawan when he gets to the NFL with a legit rotation, they've added guys like Kyle Love and Starr and Vernon Butler this past year and Paul Soliai. So when you kind of get to take a little bit of the load off him, you get 100% Kwan more often than you, than you do when you, you're playing against the up-tempo teams in college that are just running 100 plays a game well this has been fantastic i've oh, i always enjoy getting the chance to watch defensive players especially with folks who have the expertise like charles does here so charles if you will please tell everybody where they can find you and the work that you do so that they can get the the full variety of things that that you provide everyone when it comes to the game uh okay so you can find me on twitter at four verts uh, I'm, I'm, we're still doing NFL 1000 stuff for Bleacher Report. So we'll have our free agency. Uh, some of them, some of them I've actually started coming out. I know the quarterbacks and running backs have come out. I'm pretty sure. So uh, defensive, defensive guys will start coming out. I think the last week of February. So just stay on the lookout for free agency stuff. Then we'll be doing draft, uh, draft needs, draft previews. Um, for the Falcoholic, I'm doing uh, scouting reports there. And it's really cool because we need defensive linemen, and that's my favorite position to watch. So I'll just be in a cave watching defensive linemen tape all spring, which is, sounds ideal to me. 
And uh, like we said before, uh, Justice and I, we have a podcast, Setting the Edge. You can follow it on Twitter, at Setting Edge. You can go to settingedge.com. I mean, there's nothing up there, but it, it has like the playlist and the iTunes link. And uh, we had Ian Rappaport on last week, and today we are going to record with Taylor Rooks. For uh, She works for SNY. And uh, I had an interview with my old pal, Hardy Nickerson Jr., uh, his nice. dad played in the NFL. Yeah, that's me and Hardy go way back. So uh, I just had a little conversation with him that'll be at the end of that podcast today. So be on the lookout for that this week. Yeah, that's some great stuff, folks. I mean, and I've gotten a chance. I, I gotten a chance to listen to some of um, Setting the Edge, the last week's episode, and it's great. I know I'm going to be listening to it more often for sure. Um, so I would definitely highly recommend anything that Charles is doing and what Justice is doing. And um, we'll have Justice on as well, and we'll have Charles back again um, when we can have him and when he's available. But uh, thanks again for joining us and for those of you who are new to the rsp film room you can go to the youtube channel rsp film room to check out all the content there and also to my blog www.mountwaldmanrsp.com and you probably find more offensive stuff than defensive stuff but we still got some you know gems there thanks to folks like charles and 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 the rest of the guests that we have on on a regular basis so uh thanks again and you guys have a good weekend